Book Four, Part Three of Ovid's Metamorphoses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Goldfarb. Metamorphoses by Publius Ovidius Naso. Translated by Brooks Moore. Book Four, Part Three. Throughout the land of Thebes, miraculous the power of Bacchus waxed, and far and wide Eno, his aunt, reported the great deeds by this divinity performed. Of all her sisters, only she escaped unharmed when fate destroyed them, and she knew not grief, only for sorrow of her sister's woes. While Eno vaunted of her mother joys, and of her kingly husband Athamas, and of the mighty god, her foster child, Juno, disdaining her in secret, said, how shall the offspring of a concubine transform maonian mariners overwhelm them in the ocean sacrifice a son to his deluded mother who insane tears out his entrails how shall he invent wings for three daughters of king minyas while juno unavenged bewails despite is it the end the utmost of my power his deeds instruct the way true wisdom heeds an enemy's device by the strange death of penthus all that madness could perform was well revealed to all what then denies a frenzy may unravel Eno's course to such a fate as wrought her sister's woe? A shelving path in shadows of sad yew, through utter silence to the deep descends, infernal, where the languid Styx exhales vapours, and there the shadows of the dead descend, after they leave their sacred urns and ghostly forms invade, and far and wide those dreary regions horror and bleak cold obtain. The ghosts arrived not know the way which leadeth to the Stygian city-gates, not know the melancholy palace where the swarthy Pluto stays, though streets and ways a thousand to that city lead, and gates outswing from every side, and as the sea with never-seen increase engulfs the streams unnumbered of the world, that realm enfolds the souls of men, nor ever is it filled. Around the shadowy spirits go, bloodless, boneless, and bodiless. They throng the place of judgment, or they haunt the mansion where abides the utmost tyrant, or they tend to various callings as their whilom way. Appropriate punishment confines to pain the multitude condemned. To this abode, impelled by rage and hate, from habitation celestial, Juno of Saturn born descends, submissive to its dreadful element. No sooner had she entered the sad gates than groans were uttered by the threshold, pressed by her immortal form, and Cerberus, upraising his three-visaged mouths, gave vent to triple-barking howls. She called to her the sisters, night-begot, implacable, terrific furies. They did sit before the prison portals, adamant confined, combing black vipers from their horrid hair. When her amid the night's surrounding shades they recognized, those deities uprose. O oh, dread confines, dark seat of wretched vice, where stretched athwart nine acres, Titius, must thou endure thine entrails to be torn. O oh, Tantalus, thou canst not touch the wave, and from thy clutch the hanging branches rise. O oh, Sisyphus, thou canst not stay the stone, catching or pushing, it must fall again. O oh, thou Ixion, whirled around, around, thyself must follow to escape thyself. And O oh, Belides, plotter of sad death upon thy cousins, thou art always doomed to dip forever ever spilling waves. When that the daughter of Saturnus fixed a stern look on those wretches, first her glance arrested on Ixion, but the next on Sisyphus, and thus the goddess spoke, for why should he alone of all his kin suffer eternal doom, while Athamas, luxurious in a sumptuous palace, reigns, and, haughty with his wife, despises me? So grieved she, and expressed the rage of hate that such dissent inspired, beseeching thus, no longer should the house of Cadmus stand, so that the sister furies plunge in crime overweening Athamas. Entreating them, she mingled promises with her commands. When Juno ended speech, Tisiphone, whose locks entangled are not ever smooth, tossed them around, that backward from her face such crawling snakes were thrown. Then answered she, Since what thy will decrees may well be done, why need we to consult with many words? Leave thou this hateful region, and convey thyself contented to a better realm. Rejoicing, Juno hastens to the clouds. Before she enters her celestial home, Iris, the child of Thalmus, purifies her limbs in sprinkled water. Waiting not, 
Tisiphone, revengeful, takes a torch, besmeared with blood and vested in a robe, dripping with crimson gore and twisting snakes and girdled, she departs her dire abode, with twitching madness, terror, fear, and woe. And when she had arrived at the destined house, the doorposts shrank from her, the maple doors turned ashen gray, the sun, amazed, fled. Affrighted, Athamas and Eno viewed and fled these prodigies. But suddenly that baneful fury stood across the way, blocking the passage. There she stands, with arms extended and alive, with twisting vipers. She shakes her hair. The moving serpents hiss. They cling upon her shoulders, and they glide around her temples, dart their fangs, and vomit corruption. Plucking from the midst two snakes, she hurls them with her pestilential hand upon her victims, Athamas and Eno, whom, although the vipers strike upon their breasts, no injury attacks their mortal parts, only their minds are stricken with wild rage, inciting to mad violence and crime. And with a monstrous composite of foam, once gathered from the mouth of Cerberus, the venom of Echidna, purposeless aberrances, crimes, tears, hatred— the lust of homicide, and the dark vaporings of foolish brains, a liquid poison mixed and mingled with fresh blood in hollow brass, and boiled and stirred up with a slip of hemlock. She took of it, and as they trembled, threw that mad-mixed poison on them, and it scorched their inmost vitals, and she waved her torch repeatedly within a circle's rim, and added flame to flame. Then, confident of having executed her commands the fury hastened to the void expanse where pluto reigns and swiftly put aside the serpents that were wreathed around her robes at once the son of aeolus enraged shouts loudly in his palace ho my lads spread out your nets a savage lioness and her twin whelps are lurking in the wood behold them in his madness he believes his wife a savage beast he follows her and quickly from her bosom snatches up her smiling babe laearchus holding forth his tiny arms and whirls him in the air times twice and thrice as whirls the whizzing sling and dashes him in pieces on the rocks cracking his infant bones the mother roused to frenzy who can tell if grief the cause or fires of scattered poison yells aloud and with her torn hair tangled running mad she carries swiftly in her clutching arms her little melicerta and begins to shout eva way bacche juno hears the shouted name of bacchus and she laughs and taunts her let thy foster child award there is a crag out jutting on the deep worn hollow at the base by many waves where not the rain may ripple on that pool High up the rugged summit overhangs its ragged brows above the open sea. There Eno climbs with frenzy-given strength, and fearless with her burden in her arms, leaps in the waves where whitening foams arise. Venus takes pity on her guiltless child, unfortunate granddaughter, and begins to soothe her uncle Neptune with these words. O Neptune! ruler of the deep to whom next to the power in heaven was given sway consider my request open thy heart to my descendants which thine eyes behold tossed on the wild ionian sea i do implore thee remember they are thy true deities are thine as well as mine for it is known my birth was from the white foam of thy sea a truth made certain by my grecian name neptune regards her prayer he takes from them their mortal dross he clothes in majesty and hallows their appearance even their names and forms are altered melicerta changed is now palaemon called and eno changed leucothoe called are known as deities when her sidonian attendants traced fresh footprints to the last verge of the rock and found no further vestige they declared her dead nor had they any doubt of it they tore their garments and their hair, and wailed the house of Cadmus, and they cursed at Juno for the sad fate of the wretched concubine. That goddess could no longer brook their words, and thus made answer, I will make of you eternal monuments of my revenge. Her words were instantly confirmed. The one whose love for Ina was the greatest cried, Into the deep! Look! Look! I seek my queen! But even as she tried to leap, she stood fast rooted to the ever-living rock, Another, as she tried to beat her breast with blows repeated, noticed that her arms grew stiff and hard. Another, as by chance, was petrified with hands stretched over the waves. Another could be seen, as suddenly her fingers hardened, clutching at her hair to tear it from the roots, and each remained forever in the posture first assumed. But others of those women, sprung from Cadmus, were changed to birds, that always with wide wings skim lightly the dark surface of that sea. 
unwitting that his daughter and his son are ocean deities, Agenor's son, depressed by sorrow and unnumbered woes, calamities, and prodigies untold, the founder fled the city he had built, as though fatalities that gathered round that city grieved him deeper than the fate of his own family, and thence at last arrived the confines of Illyria, in exile with his wife waited with woe bowed down with years their minds recalled the time when first disaster fell upon their house relating their misfortunes cadmus spoke was that a sacred dragon that my spear impaled when on the way from sidon's gates i planted in the earth those dragon teeth unthought of seed if haply tis the gods whose rage unerring gives me to revenge i only pray that i may lengthen out as any serpent even as he spoke he saw and felt himself increase in length his body coiled into a serpent's form bright scales enveloped his indurate skin and azure macules in speckled pride enriched his glowing folds and as he fell supinely on his breast his legs were joined and gradually tapered as a serpent's tail some time his arms remained which stretching forth while tears rolled down his human face not changed as yet he said hither o hapless one come hither my unhappy wife while aught is left of manhood touch me take my hand unchanged as yet ah soon this serpent form will cover me so did he speak nor thought to make an end but suddenly his tongue became twin forked as often as he tried a hissing sound escaped the only voice that nature left him and his wife bewailed and smote her breast ah cadmus ah most helpless one put off that monster shape your feet your shoulders and your hands are gone your manly form your very colour gone all all is changed oh why not ye celestial gods me likewise to a serpent shape transform so ended her complaint cadmus caressed her gently with his tongue and slid to her dear bosom just as if he knew his wife and he embraced her and he touched her neck all their attendants who had seen the change were filled with fear but when as crested snakes the twain appeared in brightly glistening mail their grief was lightened and the pair enwreathed in twisting coils departed from that place and sought a covert in the nearest grove there then these gentle serpents never shun mankind nor wound nor strike with poisoned fangs for they are always conscious of the past the fortune of their grandson Bacchus gave great comfort to them, as a god adored in conquered India, by Achaea praised in stately temples. But Acrisius, the son of Abbas of the Cadmian race, remained to banish Bacchus from the walls of Argos and to lift up hostile arms against that deity, who he denied was born to Jove. He would not even grant that Perseus from the loins of Jupiter was god of Danae in the showering gold so mighty is the hidden power of truth acrisius soon lamented that affront to bacchus and that ever he refused to own his grandson for the one achieved high heaven and the other as he bore the viperous monster head on sounding wings hovered a conqueror in the fluent air over sands libyan where the gorgon head dropped clots of gore that quickening on the ground became unnumbered serpents fitting cause to curse with vipers that infested land thence wafted by the never constant winds through boundless latitudes now here now there as flits a vapour cloud in dizzy flight down looking from the lofty skies on earth removed far so compassed he the world three times did he behold the frozen bears times thrice his gaze was on the crab's bent arms now shifting to the west now to the east how often changed his course time came when day declining he began to fear the night by which he stopped his flight far in the west the realm of atlas where he sought repose till lucifer might call aurora's fires aurora chariot of the day there dwelt huge atlas vaster than the race of man son of iapetus his lordly sway extended over those extreme domains and over oceans that command their waves to take the panting coursers of the sun and bathe the wearied chariot of the day for him a thousand flocks a thousand herds over wandered pasture fields and neighbour tribes might none disturb that land a glint with gold bright leaves adorn the trees boughs golden wrought bear apples of pure gold and perseus spoke to atlas o oh, my friend if thou art moved to hear the story of a noble race the author of my life is jupiter if valiant deeds perhaps are thy delight mine may deserve thy praise behold of thee kind treatment i implore a place of rest but atlas mindful of an oracle since by thamus the parnassian told recalled these words o atlas mark the day a son of jupiter shall come to spoil for when thy trees be stripped of golden fruit the glory shall be his 
fearful of this atlas had built solid walls around his orchard and secured a dragon huge that kept perpetual guard and thence expelled all strangers from his land wherefore he said be gone the glory of your deeds is all pretense even jupiter will fail your need with that he added force and strove to drive the hesitating alien from his doors who pled reprieve or threatened with bold words although he dared not rival atlas might perseus made this reply for that my love you hold in light esteem let this be yours he said no more but turning his own face he showed upon his left medusa's head abhorrent features atlas huge and vast becomes a mountain his great beard and hair are forests and his shoulders and his hands mountainous ridges and his head the top of a high peak his bones are changed to rocks augmented on all sides enormous height attains his growth for so ordained it ye o mighty gods who now the heavens expanse unnumbered stars on him command to rest in their eternal prison aeolus grandson of hippotas had shut the winds and lucifer reminder of our toil in splendour rose upon the lofty sky and perseus bound his wings upon his feet on each foot bound he them his sword he girt and sped wing-footed through the liquid air in numerous kingdoms far behind were left till peoples ethiopic and the lands of cepheus were beneath his lofty view there ammon the unjust had made decree andromeda the innocent should grieve her mother's tongue they bound her fettered arms fast to the rock when perseus her beheld as marble he would deem her but the breeze moved in her hair and from her streaming eyes the warm tears fell her beauty so amazed his heart unconscious captive of her charms that almost his swift wings forgot to wave alighted on the ground he thus began o fairest whom these chains become not so but worthy are for links that lovers bind make known to me your country's name and yours and wherefore bound in chains a moment then as overcome with shame she made no sound were not she fettered she would surely hide her blushing head but what she could perform that did she do she filled her eyes with tears so pleaded he that lest refusal seem implied confession of a crime she told her name her country's name and how her charms had been her mother's pride but as she spoke the mighty ocean roared over the waves a monster fast approached its head held high abreast the wide expanse the virgin shrieked no aid her wretched father gave nor aid her still more wretched mother but they wept and mingled lamentations with their tears clinging distracted to her fettered form and thus the stranger spoke to them time waits for tears but flies the moment of our need were i who am the son of regal jove and her whom he embraced in showers of gold leaving her pregnant in her brazen cell i perseus who destroyed the gorgon wreathed with snake hair i who dared on waving wings to cleave ethereal air were i to ask the maid in marriage i should be preferred above all others as your son-in-law not satisfied with deeds achieved i strive to add such merit as the gods permit now therefore should my valour save her life be it conditioned that i win her love to this her parents gave a glad assent for who could hesitate and they entreat and promise him the kingdom as a dower as a great ship with steady prow speeds on forced forwards by the sweating arms of youth it ploughs the deep so breasting the great waves the monster moved until to reach the rock no further space remained than might the whirl of balearic string encompass through the middle skies with plummet mould of lead that instant spurning with his feet the ground the youth rose upwards to a cloudy height and when the shadow of the hero marked the surface of the sea this monster sought vainly to vent his fury on the shade as the swift bird of jove when he beholds a basking serpent in an open field exposing to the sun its mottled back and seizes on its tail lest it shall turn to strike with venomed fang he fixes fast his grasping talons in the scaly neck so did the winged youth in rapid flight through yielding elements press down on the great monster's back and thrust his sword sheer to the hilt in its right shoulder loud its frightful torture sounded over the waves so fought the hero son of inachus wild with the grievous wound the monster rears high in the air or plunges in the waves or wheels around as turns the frightened boar shunning the hounds around him in full cry the hero on his active wings avoids the monster's jaws and with his crooked sword tortures its back wherever he may pierce its mail of hollow shell or strikes betwixt the ribs each side or wounds its lashing tail long tapered as a fish 
the monster spouts forth streams incarnadined with blood that spray upon the hero's wings who drenched and heavy with the spume no longer dares to trust existence to his dripping wings but he discerns a rock which rises clear above the water when the sea is calm but now is covered by the lashing waves on this he rests and as his left hand holds firm on the upmost ledge he thrusts his sword times more than three unswerving in his aim sheer through the monster's entrails shouts of praise resound along the shores and even the gods may hear his glory in their high abodes her parents cepheus and cassiope most joyfully salute their son-in-law declaring him the saviour of their house and now her chain struck off the lovely cause and guerdon of his toil walks on the shore the hero washes his victorious hands in water newly taken from the sea but lest the sand upon the shore might harm the viper-covered head he first prepared a bed of springing leaves on which he threw weeds of the sea produced beneath the waves on them he laid medusa's awful face daughter of phorcus and the living weeds fresh taken from the boundless deep imbibed the monster's poison in their spongy pith they hardened at the touch and felt in branch and leaf unwonted stiffness sea nymphs too attempted to perform that prodigy on numerous other weeds with like result so pleased at their success they raised new seeds from plants wide scattered on the salt expanse even from that day the coral has retained such wondrous nature that exposed to air it hardens thus a plant beneath the waves becomes a stone when taken from the sea three altars to three gods he made of turf to thee victorious virgin did he build an altar on the right to mercury an altar on the left and unto jove an altar in the midst he sacrificed a heifer to minerva and a calf to mercury the wing-foot and a bull to thee o greatest of the deities without a dower he takes andromeda the guerdon of his glorious victory nor hesitates now pacing in the van both love and hymen wave the flaring torch abundant perfumes lavished in the flames the houses are bedecked with wreathed flowers and lyres and flageolets resound and songs felicit notes that happy hearts declare the portals opened sumptuous halls display their golden splendors and the noble lords of cepheus court take places at the feast magnificently served after the feast when every heart was warming to the joys of genial bacchus then lincidian perseus asked about the land and its ways about the customs and the character of its heroes straightway one of the dinner companions made reply and asked in turn now valiant perseus pray tell the story of the deed that all may know and what the arts and power prevailed when you struck off the serpent-covered head there is continued perseus of the house of agenor there is a spot beneath cold atlas wherein bulwarks of enormous strength to guard its rocky entrance dwelt two sisters born of phorcus these were wont to share in turn a single eye between them this by craft i got possession of when one essayed to hand it to the other i put forth my hand and took it as it passed between then far remote through rocky pathless crags over wild hills that bristled with great woods i thence arrived to where the gorgon dwelt along the way in fields and by the roads i saw on all sides men and animals like statues turned to flinty stone at sight of dread medusa's visage nevertheless reflected on the brazen shield i bore upon my left i saw her horrid face when she was helpless in the power of sleep and even her serpent hair was slumber-bound i struck and took her head sheer from the neck to winged pegasus the blood gave birth and his brother also twins of rapid wing so did he speak and truly told besides the perils of his journey arduous and long he told of seas and lands that far beneath him he had seen and of the stars that he had touched while on his waving wings and yet before they were aware the tale was ended he was silent then rejoined a noble with enquiry why alone of those three sisters snakes were interspersed in dread medusa's locks and he replied because o stranger it is your desire to learn what worthy is for me to tell hear ye the cause beyond all others she was famed for beauty and the envious hope of many suitors words would fail to tell the glory of her hair most wonderful of all her charms a friend declared to me he saw its lovely splendour fame declares the sovereign of the sea attained her love in chaste minerva's temple while enraged she turned her head away and held her shield before her eyes to punish that great crime minerva changed the gorgon's splendid hair to serpents horrible and now to strike her foes with fear she wears upon her breast those awful vipers creatures of her rage end of book four part three recording by david goldfarb houston texas